can't really. Right, so uh, welcome everybody. This is the 14th and final Bible study on the amazing Acts of the Apostles. Can you believe it? Number 14. And today's title is called Faithful God. Faithful God. And it's taken from Acts chapter 28, verses 1 to 10. Acts chapter 28, verses 1 to 10. So uh, before we read Acts chapter 28, verses 1 to 10, please let us pray. Let's pray. Dear Father God, we uh, thank you that you are a faithful God. And we just pray to you, Lord, in our times of need, knowing and remembering that you are a faithful God. We thank you, Lord, that you use us for your glory and you use us in ways to show your faithfulness and you display your faithfulness to us, even now, just as you did to the Apostle Paul and all those people on the ship with him. So help us to remember your faithfulness, O oh God, as we um, run through this uh, chapter, chapter 28, verses 1 to 10. And help us to think of our saviour Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Okay let's read. Now when they had escaped they then found out that the island was called Malta and the natives showed us unusual kindness. For they kindled a fire and made us all welcome because of the rain that was falling and because of the cold. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. So when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said one to another, no doubt this man is a murderer whom, though he has escaped the sea, yet justice does not allow to live. But he shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. However, they were expecting that he would swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But after they had looked for a long time and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. In that region, there was an estate of the leading citizen of the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and entertained us courteously for three days. And it happened that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and dysentery. Paul went in to him and prayed, and he laid his hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, the rest of those on the island who had diseases also came and were healed. They, on, they honoured us also in many ways, and when we departed, they provided such things as were necessary. Amen. So what is going on here? Well, if you refer to the previous chapter, Acts chapter 27, it tells of the Apostle Paul's voyage to Rome. There was a storm and there was a crew that ended up shipwrecked. But all 276 passengers, as verse 37 tells us, safely made it to shore. And then in Acts chapter 28, verse 1, they find out that the island that they'd landed on was called Malta. If you have the King James Version, you'll have the original Greek name, Melita, but it's Malta. And God is faithful. And he had told the Apostle Paul that he would go to Rome. Way back in Acts chapter 23, verse 11, the Lord appears to Paul and says to him, take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, Paul, so you must also testify in Rome. So the Lord had told him this. And we see the faithfulness of God. And there are things that he tells us that sometimes do not come to pass immediately. He appeared in chapter 23. And in verse and in chapter 28, he still had not arrived in in Rome. So time had passed. But we must remind ourselves that our faithful God has always proved himself to be faithful and will continue to do so. And if we are waiting for something, we must think about the faithfulness of God. 
and be patient and remember his word and remember what he has told us. The Apostle Paul was going to Rome, even though during this storm in chapter 27, the people thought that all hope was lost and the soldiers even considered killing the prisoners. But it was the Apostle Paul who was the encourager. He was the one that, that, that said, no, no, don't do that. He, he was the one that urged the men to eat and to not give up hope. And then just to remind Paul in Acts chapter 27, verse 24, God sends his angel to him again and says to him, Paul, do not be afraid. You must stand trial before Caesar. And then he tells him what he's going to do. He says, God has graciously given you the lives of all these people who are sailing with you. How lovely that God gave the Apostle Paul a reminder that he would stand before Caesar. And God sends us reminders now, more commonly through reading his word rather than sending an angel. We commonly read his word and the Holy Spirit reminds us of the word of God. And the Apostle Paul encourages the people. He says, keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Even the Apostle Paul's words led him to believe and led others to believe that the God he worshipped and served is a faithful God. And Paul's experiences taught him that the God he worshipped is a faithful God. And we as Christians must remember in our previous trials and experiences in the past what God has taught us and remember that his faithfulness guided us through that and brought us through. And sometimes our faithful God, he takes us through a storm. He takes us through being shipwrecked. He even takes us through being bitten like a snake on an island to make us realize that we serve a faithful God. And he brings us into these situations to prove his faithfulness. So Paul and the crew land on shore and they would have been freezing. They gathered together. And the local people of Melita or Malta, they saw what was happening and they came to help. They built a fire so that the shivering people could warm up. Verse two of Acts chapter 28 says, they made us all feel welcome because of the rain and the cold. And that's the right thing to do, isn't it? To help people in need, to help start a fire so these cold people can get warm. And there is this inward knowledge that people have even though they don't worship the God of the Bible but there's this inward knowledge of knowing the right thing to do and this shows that God has revealed himself to people and people have this sense of morality because the Bible says that God has written his law in their hearts now this does not mean that all people are saved but there is something of the living God in all people he breathed his breath into us to make us come alive because God is faithful and he gives people the opportunity in knowing him by seeing nature, by thinking, how was all this formed? It makes us think about God and he gives us the opportunity to repent and turn to him in faith. So the Apostle Paul is there and in verse three, he's gathering this, the, a bundle of sticks to put into the fire. And we see that the leadership of, of the Apostle Paul, he didn't mind helping out in these kind of simple tasks. If you read chapter 27 on the ship, the Apostle Paul took on the role of the leader when the people were despondent. These people hadn't eaten for 14 days and they were feeling low until Paul encouraged them. He says, come on, guys, take some food. And how important encouraging words are, particularly in times of sadness and despondency. And words of God, when spoken into situations of disaster or when things, things seem dire, help us to focus on the lordship of Jesus. And it changes the atmosphere. It's so easy to mope about and complain about all things we perceive are wrong. And someone's done this wrong and this is wrong. But a word of encouragement can change the atmosphere and bring our focus on Jesus. And we can use the word, but God, things are going bad, but God is faithful. I feel a bit despondent, but God is with me. 
I feel things are not going right for me. But the Lord Jesus, he's there with us. Let's speak the right words into our atmosphere. And that will bless not just others, but it will encourage ourselves too. So they're on the shore and Paul is still the kind of leader because now his credibility is established. And when it comes to gathering the sticks, he doesn't say to the other 275 people, Oi, you, you go and gather the sticks. No, he just does it himself. And we see that a true leader is willing to do the menial, humble tasks that other people may normally do. They were 14 days fighting a hurricane, 14 days without food. The people have managed to swim through this hurricane and this wind to get to the shore. They're soaking wet. And here the Apostle Paul is in the rain, in the cold, picking up sticks to help the fire get, get lit up and to warm the rest of the people. And in times like this, instead of waiting for others to take care of things and bring things to us and complaining when they don't, let the Christian take initiative to bring glory to the Lord Jesus. Let the Christian be the doer rather than the complainer in these situations. The one who serves others, especially in situations where they don't need to, they're not required to, or perhaps they're in a higher position. When they serve, it brings glory to the Lord Jesus. The Lord says, for the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And in faithfully serving other people, they too can see that God is faithful. In showing people that we have this character of faithfulness, of servitude, we, they can see that we serve a faithful God. And true leadership includes having the mind of a servant, the eagerness to do the humble tasks. And humility is needed for effective leadership. You know, anyone can be a leader and lead something. You can choose. Uh, who wants to be the leader? Uh, you? OK, you can do it. But to be an effective leader is something else. And the Apostle Paul was an effective leader because he had that godly character of faithfulness in him. And we look at the example of the Lord Jesus in John chapter 13. He was faithful. He washed the disciples feet. He was humble. And then he says to the disciples, the future leaders of the early church, he says, you do what I have done to you. As I have washed your feet, you wash each other's feet. What he was telling them was if you want to lead, you have to lead with the mentality of a servant. And then in this fire, verse three, this viper, this snake comes out because of the heat and fastens on Paul's hand. Now the natives would have known about snakes and when they saw this snake fasten itself to, to, to Paul's hand, they were certain that he was going to be dead. Hold on a second. The Apostle Paul was serving God. He was serving people. Where's the faithfulness of God here? There was a snake bite. Well, the reasoning was that while Paul had escaped death at sea, the people of Malta thought the goddess of justice had chosen to bring Paul retribution by killing him by sending a snake. These people of Malta reasoned that Paul must have done something really bad, and now he was going to pay for it. But Paul was faithful to God. He had lived as a true servant to God. But we learn that despite this, this does not keep him from the trial of the snake bite or the shipwreck or the cold. And that's true for us. God is faithful as we serve him, and he allows things to happen, even serious things, not to punish us, no but to show his faithfulness to us and to others. Have a look at Paul's reaction in verse five. He shakes the snake off into the fire. He seemed pretty calm and unconcer unconcerned. He didn't scream, Lord, I'm serving you. What are you doing? Why, why is this snake, snake bitten me? No. The reason was that in the Apostle Paul's experience of serving the living God, he knew that God was faithful and that God was faithful to his word. And nothing was going to stop him from, from going to Rome. Not even this snake, this poisonous snake. God had told Paul that he would stand trial. And Paul believed God. And this reminds us of Abraham, who also believed God to what he was told. And God credited it to him as righteousness. 
So let us believe that God is faithful and his promises are yes and amen to us in Christ Jesus. And to obtain his blessings and promises, we have to have faith in Jesus. And if we do, all his faithful promises are obtained in him as we read about them and appropriate them in faith to us in his word. Verse four, the people are thinking, oh, this is a murderer. Justice is going to get him, though. And it was a poisonous snake. And the word justice here is actually the name of a god, decay. And in Greek mythology, decay was the goddess personified as the goddess of justice. So they're all expecting the apostle Paul to fall dead. And it's interesting that these pagan people, uninformed about Christianity, having no idea about the God of Israel, no revelation of God, no knowledge that there's a Jewish community who God revealed his word to, they had a sense of right and wrong. They had a sense of justice and a sense that wrong things get punished. In other words, in their humanity, they had a sense of when you do wrong things, there'll be consequences. Even to the unconverted, there is a sense of morality. But where, where does this come from? Romans chapter one, verse 18 answers this question. And the apostle Paul writes, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. In other words, God says that men know the truth. Men know the right thing to do, but suppress it because of this and choose evil. And verse 19 says, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. You see, in man's heart, there is a sense of love. There's a sense of kindness. There's a sense of justice and there's a sense of morality. And we see these pagans with no written revelation of God. They have the law of God internally somehow revealed that they would show kindness and love towards strangers. And they would show this sense of morality that wrong deserves judgment. And in a saying sometimes attributed to Blaise Pascal, the French philosopher, it says, there is a God shaped vacuum in the heart of each man, which cannot be satisfied by anything but only by God the creator made known through Jesus Christ. And God is faithful. And there might be people we know that really have a good sense of right and wrong. They do good things, but they need to believe in the Lord to be saved of their sins. And God says, if we search for him with all our heart, we will find him. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 12, it says, you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. God says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart and I will be found of you, declares the Lord. Doing good deeds is not enough. The people that we know that are good, doing good things, they must come and believe in the Lord Jesus. Have a look at verse five. The Apostle Paul shakes off the snake and suffered no harm. The people realize actually he's been bitten by a snake, but he's not dying. So they changed their minds. They thought he's not being punished by the gods. He is a god. How fickle humans can be. But this incident with the snake that God ordained, the snake bite, it gave the Apostle Paul much more credibility. And it gave him an audience that was attentive and watching. What is, what's he going to do next? And verse 11 says that the Apostle Paul was with these people for three months. So that's the opportunity where he preached Jesus Christ. And nothing, nothing at all with a shipwreck or poisonous snake or cold weather can thwart God's purpose for his servants until their work is done. You know, there's works for each Christian to do ordained before the foundation of the world. And as we faithfully serve God, God brings order and he brings these things so we can accomplish those works. God is faithful to his word. And even when we go wrong and make mistakes, God still remains faithful. Oh, is this an excuse to sin because God is always faithful? No, it's not. Rather, it's a reassurance that when we go wrong and repent and admit our wrongdoing and sin, God is faithful and he's still faithful. 
1 John chapter 9 verse 9 says if we confess our sins he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness we serve a faithful God and this incident with the snake is a fulfillment of prophecy from Luke chapter 10 when the Lord Jesus sent out the 70 to talk about and preach the kingdom of God he told them in verse 18 he said Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Also in Mark chapter 16, verse 18, the Lord says to his disciples, go into all the word and preach the gospels. And there'll be many signs that will accompany you. To those who believe, they will drive out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. You see, we see the words of the Lord fulfilled here as we serve him. And when we serve God and commit our ways fully to him, he always proves himself faithful. And look at the sovereignty of God in verse seven. Have a look at this. The leading citizen of the island who received us and entertained us. We see the providence of God where the ship just happened to land at a place owned by the governor of the island called Publius, and he was Rome's representative on the island of Malta. And Publius was able to entertain all 276 people for three days. And there's no such thing as chance for the Christian. Things happen to us because God is faithful. Sometimes he allows things, sometimes he ordains things. But either way, whatever happens to us, he's proving his faithfulness. If God provides immediately, glory to God, God is faithful. If God provides later, glory to God, he is faithful. God may be teaching us something as we wait, as we adapt, as we think about him, as we exercise faith. That's why he sometimes gives it later, because God is faithful. Sometimes we ask and God gives us something different to what we wanted or what we thought best. And that also is evidence of God being faithful. And it's about learning to trust him with the outcome as we ask and pray because God brings order to our lives. We see again in Publius the internal of revelation to God. Even this individual without a knowledge of Jesus Christ, without the law of Moses, without knowing to love your neighbor, even with a person without those things has a sense of what to do when people need help. And that's because the law of God is written in human hearts where the conscience bears witness. Now, again, just emphasize that doesn't mean that all people are saved, but it emphasizes the sovereignty of God, where he gives opportunity to put our faith and trust in Jesus and believe in him to be saved. And God provided for his servants through the hospitality and kindness from the, from the people of Malta because God is faithful. God put Paul and the others on the ship for a storm to face the wind and the waves to be shipwrecked and cold because God is faithful. He was going to preach the gospel to these people. And God shows his faithfulness to us as he helps us navigate through our trial. We must, we must have faith in him that he is a faithful God. And even in verse 10 of Acts chapter 28, when the crew leave, the islanders honoured them with many gifts. We see the faithfulness of God and his provision. And in verse 8, Publius's father was sick of a fever and he had dysentery and Paul went to him and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him so he did two things he prayed and he laid his hands on him why well he prayed to God to acknowledge that all power is, is from God and secondly he laid his hands on him to show people that it was through the apostle Paul that God was moving in power the power was God, but Paul was the human vessel of that power. And that's what we are as Christians. Let us be wholly available as a vessel of God for him to use us in whatever way he chooses. For some, he will use our hands to bring about healing. For others, God will use our hands to support people. For others, he will use our hands to provide to others. But let us be available. And this provision of God meant that the news of this would have spread around the island. And soon all the sick people came and were healed by God's power. And this is wonderful. Paul's case is not unique, is it? 
in biographies of missionaries, you'll find these amazing miracles of how God heals people and casts out demons for people. And it brings attention so the people can preach Jesus Christ. And God is faithful. He provides food, he provides money, and he provides the right people at the right time. And look at the faithfulness and blessing of God in contrast to the misery of the last 14 days at sea. God gave the Apostle Paul and others on the ship relief and replenish their, their stock. And this happens, doesn't it? So we can appreciate the goodness and faithfulness of God. We go through trials so we can contrast. This is what it was like, 14 days on a ship. But now we see the faithfulness of God. You see, the way humans learn is in order to see light, we need to know what darkness is like. In order to know rest, we need to know what striving and tiredness feels like. And in order to appreciate the faithfulness of God, we need to know what it's like to be in the trial. And we need to know how God brings us out of that. And that's how we appreciate the goodness and faithfulness of God. We contrast it to what he has brought us through. And that's why God puts us through trials. Have a look at verse nine. The rest of the people also came. And these healings, along with the snake bite, would have given Paul just this credibility that he wouldn't have had beforehand. And it would have probably raised questions. These I the, the islanders of Malta thinking, what kind of God does this man worship? Who is this Jesus that he's preaching? Why wasn't this man worried when he got bitten by the snake? And this would have opened the doors for telling the people about the Lord Jesus, that he's the one, he's the faithful one that brings the Apostle Paul through. And let that be the Christian's testimony as people talk about us saying, why are these people so loving and kind? Why do they keep faith in their Jesus despite going through a trial? Why are they so faithful in reading their Bible? And then we can tell them about the faithfulness and goodness of God, that he's the one that brings us through, that it's his, it's his faithfulness that keeps us going. And we point them to the one person that can help them, and that is Jesus Christ. And we see the presence of God through the Christian. We see Paul's presence on the ship and on the island proved to be a blessing to all the people that were with him. You see, everybody, all 276 people were saved because Paul was there and the favor of God was upon him. And he brought the protection and provision and favor of God. And that's what we are as Christians. The spirit of God, the spirit of the living God dwells within us. And we bring the favor and light of God to the people that we meet. And because of the faithfulness of God in healing the sick through the Apostle Paul, every one of his shipmates enjoyed the generous provisions given by the people on the island. And Paul's presence gave them access to the blessings of God that the others, other people enjoy. You know, the Lord Jesus tells us to be salt and light in the world. Matthew chapter five, verse 14, he says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. And he says, he says to Christians in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your father in heaven. The God we serve is a faithful God. So in conclusion, we see that God's faithfulness, even in our trial, even in our situation where we're thinking, Lord, I'm feeling poor in spirit. We are blessed because this is a way that can bring him glory. And God gives believers spiritual gifts and glory to God for those to bless other people and to edify the church. But this is not the only way that we can be a blessing to others. Paul blessed his shipmates by gathering firewood. You know, we can do lowly tasks, and by doing those, um, we show people this attitude of humility that brings glory to God and it bears witness to others. And also we see that God's faithfulness is seen in our lives as we contrast where we were and where we are now. And perhaps some of us are where we are now. We're in a storm. We're going to be shipwrecked. But we can be confident that this too will pass. This too will pass. The blessing of God is upon you as you're going through the storm and shipwreck. 
God's provision is with you. The spirit of God is with you. And it's a learning thing so we can learn to trust God and glorify him in his faithfulness. In our trials, we can look back and sing those lovely words from, from Jen Johnson. And it's the song that goes, and all my life, God, you have been faithful. And all my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Can we get an amen? Let's pray. Oh, precious Father God, you are a faithful God and you are the faithful one who is faithfully with us in our trials and in our situations. And thank you, Lord God, that the blessings don't necessarily follow after the trials and situations. The blessings are there with us through the trials and situations. And the reason is because you are a faithful God. And thank you, Lord Jesus, that you were faithful to your task. You looked after your disciples. Not one of them perished except for the son of perdition that was prophesied. And in the same way you looked after them, you looked up, you look after us. And we look to the cross and we remember that the Lord Jesus fulfilled his task. You were faithful to your task. And we pray, Lord God, help us to be faithful to you. Help us, Lord, to fulfill the task that you've ordained for us before the foundation of the world. And in those times we have been faithless. Father, forgive us. Forgive us. We call it out as sin. It was wrong. And help us to get back on track. Father, we break off faithlessness from us and help us to learn from that and look unto you, Lord Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. You are the faithful one. And our faithfulness comes from your example and from reading your word. So help us, Lord, this week to remember your faithfulness in our trial and our situation. And through it, let us experience your love. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Okay. Thank you, everybody.